started. So today we are going to have a look at the Mycenaeans who are, well, these are the people that the ancient Greeks thought were ancient. So we're going for super ancient, double ancient history today. Um, uh, you can notice by the map that I've got on the screen here that we're looking in the same place as ancient Greece. It's just earlier. Yeah. So some of the places already people have pointed out that there are no, um, there's no Sparta on here that hasn't been built. Athens would have been quite a small little insignificant place at this point as well. Um, the capital or, or one of the main cities, as far as we can tell, would have been Mycenae itself, but big cities at Pylos and Tiryns as well, uh, plus these other little places too. Um, someone just asked, what about the Persians? No Persians. No, the Persians are still, you know, somewhere way off the map in Persia, living in a small hut somewhere. No, this, uh, this area at this point, or for most of this time, would have been ruled over by the Hittites, uh, which were another civilization that lived in Anatolia, which is modern day Turkey. So you would have had the Hittites there. The ancient Egyptians were knocking around at this time, down in Egypt. Um, uh, and the remnants of, you know, you, you'd still have the cities of Babylon and places like that as well. Um, uh, yes, and this is, of course, for those of you who are here for the geography lesson yesterday, this is the same place as modern Greece, pretty much. Modern Greece maybe doesn't stretch quite so far into Turkey, but yeah, this is pretty much the same as, as Greece is today, not far off. Um, although, if we go to Greece today, if we go to the to the city of Mycenae, this is what it looks like behind me. There isn't much of it left. Um, a few walls, no roofs. It's all kind of gone. Uh, there are a few tombs intact, which is quite cool, but uh, well, maybe we'll look at some of those later. Um, so, uh, <laughs> okay. Um, oh no, hang on, my chat's gone a bit funny. There we go. Um, ah, and that's a good question. So in the Mycenaean times, would Athens be called Athens? Probably not. To be honest, we don't know much about exactly what they called their cities. It's hard to figure this stuff out because there isn't much written evidence, although there is some, and so we'll look at that. Um, exactly what they called each of these different places is tricky. Let's put it that way. Um, so let's have a look over here. Let's put these guys in a timeline. So we've done lots of ancient history over the last, I think this is week seven. Um, so we've looked at quite a few different civilizations so far, and I thought what we'd do to start with today is kind of put these on a timeline so we've got a rough idea of where these things are happening. So we started with Sumer, uh, which linked us to, to the Epic of Gilgamesh, of course, which was founded somewhere around 2500 BC. So that's our oldest. Um, fast forward at roughly 400 years from there, we're looking at the Xia rising in China, uh, that ancient semi-mythical civilization. Uh, we only know about them from later uh, civilizations such as the Shang, uh, who come around about 1600 BC. Uh, if you're wondering, BC means, well, the standard way is before Christ. You can always also say it uh, before common era as well is another way of looking at that. Uh, but it basically means before the year zero, you'll see the year zero is here. So that was 2020 years ago, the year zero. This is all happening before that. Um, oh, I'll come back to the map in a moment uh, if I get a chance. Okay. Um, so then we've got about 75 years, give or take, after that, the Mycenaeans, they pop up. That's the group that we're talking about today. And they last for about 600 years, pretty much. Um, and then they all disappear. Um, and then to put that in sort of uh, perspective, the, the other big civilizations that we've looked at, so Athens, Sparta, Persia, and early Rome, they were all around, you know, Athens was its, its height in about 500 BC. That's the time when we've got Socrates wandering around. Uh, they're building the Parthenon, or they've just built it. Um, uh, Sparta is at the height of his power. The, the, the Persian Wars are going on all around 500 BC. So the people of Athens and Sparta and Persia and early Rome would have looked back on the Mycenaeans as ancient to them. Um, and of course, it was still another 500 years before you know, the height of imperial Rome and, uh, and Jesus is born, if you're going with that. So that's where we fit in in our timeline here. Now, I've had some requests to go back after here we are 
Uh, oh, an interesting question here. What is the earliest year after year zero? Um, the earliest year would be year one, I suppose, yes. Um, huh. And Iona has given us a fun fact here. There is giant writing next to the Great Wall of China. Hmm. I didn't even know that giants could write. There you are. I like it. <laughs> yes, and I did use the sparkly pen. Um, so yes, here's our map. Here's uh, the, the city that we're going to focus on most today is Mycenae itself. But all these little red dots across the map are places where we know that Mycenaean people were living. Now, we're, we're not going to go into this today, but the Mycenaeans, they came along at a time when another even older civilization was going away called the Minoans. So even for the Mycenaeans, they're not the first people in Greece for sure. There would have been people living there for hundreds of years before the Mycenaeans arrived and set up and started. Um, a good question, what language did they speak? We'll have a look at their written language uh, soon. We call it Linear B. Um, it, they wouldn't have called it Linear B. That's a very sort of modern name for it. Um, but I'll show you some examples of their writing uh, towards the end today. Um, so let's, uh, we'll leave our map behind and we'll say goodbye to our timeline. And we'll have a look at what this great big city behind me would have looked like, or what we think it would have looked like back in the day. So this is, uh, this picture here is a modern representation of Mycenae. Um, and this has been worked out due to, we have most of these walls remaining, or at least parts of the walls. Um, and it seems that we've got a walled city that is in quite an interesting place in Greece. It's got a big deep ravine on one side. It's got wide open fields on another side. So it's quite well protected and there's places where you can um, plant crops. Inside there seems to have been a great big palace complex um, which would have contained a Megaron. Megaron, which is uh, the name that we give to the sort of great big throne room that these people would have had. Now we don't really know what their leaders would have been like, whether they're led by priest kings or just kings or you know heroes, we're not really sure. Um, the political structure isn't very clear. Um, but we know that also within the city we had lots and lots of different houses, some of which would have been you know businesses, not just living houses. Um, we've got very thick walls. The walls around here, um, they're about 10 meters thick. So trying to get through those walls would be pretty difficult. Um, they're probably, what, what they'd have done is they'd have built up a great big load of stones and then built up the same on the other side and then filled the middle in with a whole load of gravel and dirt and bits of brick and you know all that kind of stuff um, to make it solid. But then you could walk around on top. So with a 10 meter wide wall, you've got quite a lot of room. You can, you know, you could run around with your friends on top of that wall quite easily. Um, these little black shapes that we see here, these represent people. So you can just see how wide those walls are. Yeah, these, these aren't small. Also in the city, we found tombs. So here's uh, something called Grave Circle A, which is a great big grave, I and mean, we call it that. They probably wouldn't have. Um, but this seems to be a royal tomb where they buried the, the leaders whoever or whatever they were. Uh, more on that in a bit. So we're talking quite a huge city. Um, maybe not huge compared to modern standards because it's quite contained, but for the time, a pretty big city. And this is a very similar city to other ones at Pylos and Tiryns as well. Now, what Mycenae really is uh, famous for, I suppose, in terms of architecture, we can see here, and this is what I've got behind me. This is called the Lion Gate because what we have here is well a great big gate there would have been a wooden gate in this section of wall here and above it two great big lions stand their heads have gone probably because their heads were made out of a uh, maybe a softer stone than the stone that's there initially so it might just be that the wind the rain and the weather has worn the heads away or it could be that someone chopped them off of course mess them up because you never can tell. Um, all right, let me just go back to the chat and see what we've got here. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Uh, ah, why did the, where did the Mycenaeans come from? That's a good question. Um, and I don't know. You know, we're talking about, I mean, all people, as far as we can tell, came from Africa initially, but that would have been thousands and thousands of years before they got here. So 
what we're looking at is a group of people who are very closely related to modern Greeks, we can say that, but know exactly where they came from, whether they came down from the north or across the sea from Anatolia, from Turkey, I don't know. Um, I haven't looked into that, but that's a good question. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah th th that's it. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it, Liz. Um, they are Greeks, but before Greeks were famous. Yeah, <laughs> okay, that's a good way of looking at it. These are, the, we might call them proto-Greeks or the pre-Greeks, yeah, but they, they do have their own name, the Mycenaeans, yeah. Um, okay. So, doo -doo -doo. okay, so our gate here, um, we can see a few things. We can see, you know, the size and the power. Being able to create these great, this, this huge stone here is called a lintel, and it goes over the archway. That's multiple tons worth of stone. So these people had a way of lifting incredibly high, huge, heavy rocks, a bit like the pyramid builders over in Egypt, although that was earlier. Um, they're also using a technique called corbeling, which is where we take stones and we layer them up and we lay them up. If we want to get to an archway, we start to put bigger and bigger stones that overlap, that overhang, sorry, on top of each other until we get this sort of arch shape. And then you can fill that with decoration. So it's pretty cool, really. Um, the problem was, though, or at least the problem for the Greeks who came later, is that they couldn't work out how these cities were built. They couldn't move stones that heavy. They didn't know how it happened. Um, uh, oh, a question here, where is the gate on the map? So if we go back to our map here, we're looking at the city of Mycenae. So the gate is one of the entrances to this city here. Yeah, Mycenae, right there. Um, and so the Greeks, they had to come up with a theory as to, because they would have seen these cities, they would have been ruined by the time the Greeks came along. And the Greeks would have looked at them and scratched their heads and thought, wow, these people that came before us were pretty impressive. I wonder what they were called. I wonder what they did. And to be honest, they would have known less about them than we do. because so we've managed to take some of their writing and translate it. The Greeks wouldn't have done that as far as we know. So it would have been a real mystery to those people. Um, oh, Iona is saying hello to her dad. Hello, Iona's dad. Um, now, the Greeks, they came up with a theory as to how these things were built. And it involves this creature here. They assumed that probably what happened was the hero Perseus, he of Gorgon killing fame, uh, killer of Medusa, um, probably bought over a load of cyclopses from Turkey, or cyclopes, and these great big one-eyed giants would have built the walls. So the city walls are known as cyclopean walls, because they could only possibly have been built by cyclopses. People can't lift rocks that big, and there's no technology that can help them do it. Therefore, it must have been a giant one-eyed monster. Oh, yeah. There you go. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, a question here from Rock. Are the walls 10 meters thick? Yes, so they are. Um, so if we look, if we were to walk through here, there is a tunnel in here going between parts of the wall. In fact, I believe this is a sally port. So hidden amongst the walls in like little, little known places would have been holes through the walls where if you were being attacked, uh, the people inside, the defenders, could, po could run out through the little hidden holes. There might, might have been trees or bushes planted in front of them so people couldn't see. And they would pop out behind the attacking enemy and attack them and then run back in and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, that's a, that's a sally port hole. Not as big as the main gates. But, yeah, the walls are still really, really thick. And the idea is that nothing's getting through them. You might get over them. You might mash the gate down, but you're not getting through the walls. Uh, so let's have a look at... Some, some of the things that the Mycenaeans have left us. Here we go. And we're going to start by looking at these beautiful things here. Let's see if I can fit them on the screen. Here we go. So these are what we call frescoes. Hmm, a fresco. Um, a fresco is where we take... Um, you, you know when you're plastering a wall? I mean, you probably people probably haven't plastered a wall yourself, but you may have seen it done. Um, when you plaster a wall, you put on wet plaster. And that's the aim of the plaster is to make the wall nice and smooth and keep it together, I guess. Um, but if you were to worst your plastering a wall, if any of you out there have family who are plasterers, you know, you can get them to try this, I guess, or if you know any plasterers. Um, but when you've put the plaster on the wall, if you're very quick, 
and you paint a picture on that wall whilst the plaster is still wet before it dries and solidifies then the pigment the ink for a better word um, that you're using to paint with the paint will seep into the wall and when the wall dries or the plaster dries the ink will be stuck in there and the painting will be there forever and so this is this is what the mycenaeans were doing and this helps us because now we know um, a lot about the mycenaean culture they didn't leave much writing but they did leave loads of pictures and they could help us learn all kinds of things about these people the kind of clothes they wear the kind of things they did the kind of animals they had and the, you know just these three alone can tell us quite a lot so we'll, we'll unpack these right now um yes charlie you're right um uh, do we know how many people roughly lived in this city no i'm not sure um we're talking probably hmm, let me think we're probably talking low thousands if that um we're certainly not talking as big as Sumer or Babylon or anything like that. These are relatively small cities compared to that. Um, but maybe, you know, a thousand, two thousand, possibly something like that, I, I guess. Um, and of course, the number of people living there would have changed over time, too, because uh, Mycenae itself as a city was around for about 600 years. And it started off really small um, and it ended up quite big uh, until it was destroyed by unknown forces. Hmm. What money did they use? Uh, we'll talk about trade in a minute, actually. Um, no money, though, as far as we can tell. Um, there's no Mycenaean coins or anything like that. Uh, these people are trading, but not using the kind of money that we would consider money. Yeah, let's put it that way, I guess. Um, so let's unpack these paintings, these frescoes. Um, we've got. I've picked three here that, you know, represent different aspects of Mycenae life. Now our top one here we've got four women uh, or five women sorry traipsing along sort of maybe in a parade each one is holding different things we've got a woman here holding flowers we've got a woman here holding something called a pyxis which we'll have a look at in a minute um, we've got more flowers there move my head out of the way we've got this one here with flowers and a jar maybe a vase possibly olive oil or wine or something and then we've got another pyxis looking object here um, we're not sure entirely what they're doing because there's no explanation with this but we can assume that they're in some kind of a parade and that they are, um, you know, maybe a religious thing. Maybe they're going to visit the king or something. It's hard to say, really. Um, but um, what we can see here is someone else traveling along with some animals. So we've got a nice big dog here and we've got a big horse behind. Uh, this guy, maybe he's carrying something in, under his arm, but I can't quite see what. Hmm. And then we've got our bull jumper here we've got a guy jumping over a particularly big looking bull um hmm, looking pretty huge i like it um now some of these pictures are of women and some of them are men but you may notice that the differences between the two are actually quite difficult to spot um it seems that everyone in mycenae had long curly hair they must have curled it themselves, we assume. Um, it wasn't naturally long and curly. Um, but the men and the women, they seem to have similar hair or almost identical hairstyles. They seem to also have pretty similar clothing. Um, everyone's wearing skirts. The women may be wearing slightly more layered skirts, so a skirt over a skirt over a skirt over a skirt, whereas the men might have gone for something a little bit easier uh, or a little bit uh, less flamboyant, maybe. But the way we can actually tell who's a boy and who's a girl, because sometimes in Mycenaean art it's very difficult, um, we can tell because of the colour of their skin. Uh, if a character has white skin, like our women up here, and they, that means they are female. If they have red skin, that means that they are male. And that's probably related to people going out and working in the sun. It might be that the women stayed inside uh, and did sort of house-based jobs and so didn't get the cry the suntan that the men did although we're not entirely sure i mean every time they drew a monkey it was blue every time they drew a lion it's yellow you know they seem to have a convention with coloring so in this picture here we've got two women you know a woman is throwing this man onto the bull it looks like or something this woman here is holding the horns whilst this man is you know dancing around on the back um kind of weird yes 
too many skirts, says Alfred. Um, ah, ah Jay's, Jay's done a bit of research. He says there's 30,000 people. That's quite a lot. That's far more than I thought there would be. Interesting. Um, could they have been Egyptians, Albert Einstein? I, I don't think they are genetically related to the Egyptians. Um, this seems to be a very separate culture. They traded with the Egyptians, and so they would have known about Egypt, and I'm sure some of them visited there, because um, it's really not that far away, uh, just over the Mediterranean Sea. So I can imagine there were Egyptians in and around these societies, and yeah, you know, uh, I, I imagine there's quite a lot of mingling. Um, What's the plaster made of? That's good. So the plaster, I believe, is lime based because uh, the colours that they're using here, like our bright blues, reds and yellows, um, these are all taken from different natural dyes. And But when they wanted to get white, like our dog here, all they would do is scratch back to the bare plaster. So the bare plaster was white in itself. Um, so probably, yes, some kind of lime based plaster, I guess. Uh, so this guy's socks or whatever these are, they're not quite socks, they don't reach his feet. But, you know, we're scraping back the plaster and also on the dog. So the natural colour of the wall would have been white and then everything else is colour put over that. Uh, good question. Yeah, very good question. Um, yes. Uh, what? <laughs> so we can tell from their artwork a lot about them, but that's not all they left us. Unfortunately, because it is so ancient, we don't have any clothes left. So we can't look at an actual, you know, we can't try on uh, one of these women's dresses because, well, they all just dissolved and rotted away over the years. Um, but we can tell what they wore because we can see these pictures. So assuming that these pictures are accurate, they show us all these wonderful layered skirts, then we can assume that that's what women were wearing. Um, the men often have their tops off, but not always. Sometimes they have quite flamboyant, almost toga looking kinds of things. Yeah. Um, oh, that's a good question. What happened if you got your painting wrong? How could you correct it? So I suppose if, it, if you got it particularly wrong, you could always chip off the plaster, replaster the wall and paint again. It would have been time consuming, but it would have been possible. Um, I mean, it's really lucky for us that frescoes last so long. I mean, just think of these colors. Uh, colours this strong lasting for thousands of years it's quite amazing if you painted a, a painting uh, on some paper and just sort of left it in a room somewhere it would pretty much fade away over that time it would, certainly wouldn't look as vibrant as it does now um, but because of the method they used because it's trapped in the walls themselves we, we get the pictures saved uh, we can assume there were lots more pictures but you know, most of my scene has been crumbled away, so we don't actually have that many walls left to find the paintings on. Um, oh, uh, hello to Rio the cat as well. There you go. Um, uh, good question, Albert Einstein. Hmm. Right, but it's not just paintings, not just frescoes that the Mycenaeans have left us. Um, they've also left us, uh, well, this great big wet mess. Um, this is a shipwreck. And so those asking about money and things, this, this would fit in here. Um, this is a shipwreck just off the coast of Turkey in a place called Uluburun. Um, and as you can see, here's our diver. It's not a particularly clear picture, but there's a diver. So this is, gives us a bit of an idea of the size of this ship. And this is the Mycenaean ship that sank 3,000 years ago. It's incredible that it's still there. Um, it's only about 25 meters down, so it's not particularly deep, but it's sat there on the bottom of the Mediterranean for many years until it was discovered. Oh, when was it discovered? Some, sometime, it wasn't that long ago, to be honest. Uh, I believe sometime in the 1970s. So this ship was discovered, divers found it, and they didn't just find the ship, they found all the things that the ship was carrying. Now, this is a a sort of replica that's been made and put in a museum so people can get an idea of what would have been in here and so here we can see some of the objects we can see lots of jars we can see lots of like smaller jars down here bigger jars here and i do have a list of the things that were found uh, or at least some of the things that were found in here so let me just get my list up and i can tell you in a bit more detail um, now these things so some of the food that i'm going to mention isn't still edible, as you can imagine, after 3,000 years. But we do have evidence that it was was in the jars. So even though um, we can say what was in there, you, know, you probably wouldn't want to want to try some of these things right now. Okay, so 
in this ship, uh, in the bottom here, we found, or the, the archaeologists found, 10 tons of copper, which is, that's a lot of copper, great big heavy amount of copper, um, and one ton of tin. Now, if you've got 11 tons of metal, that takes up a bit of space and it's very heavy. So we can imagine that this ship must have been pretty strong to sank that. Is that why it sank? Probably not. Um, we can imagine that ships were going back with this amount of uh, goods all the time. Um, and if we go back to our map, just a minute, because this might help me explain this. Um, we don't know where this ship was coming from, but I, I like to imagine probably Egypt, because some of the things on it on board were very uh, African in, in feel. Um, but what we can imagine is that these, these ships, they would sail across the Mediterranean, but they would island hop. So they wouldn't go the whole way to Egypt in you know, one voyage. That would have been too dangerous, probably. So we can imagine that maybe you're leaving Mycenae, you'd, you'd find a ship, you'd get it on one of these little uh, uh, coastal settlements. You'd sail it out to one island, then maybe take a break make sure your boat's all right, then into the next, and to the next, and to the next. And you know, you'd get across the sea that way. We do know that people at this time were trading with as far as Britain. There are Phoenician ships and Phoenician finds that have been found in Britain. So, you know, may, maybe some of these goods would have been bound for Britain eventually before they sank. We just don't know. Mm. Another good question from Albert Einstein there. Yes, that, um, did they have as many earthquakes then as now? Yes, they did. Uh, and in fact, some of the Mycenaean cities, we can tell, have been destroyed by earthquakes because they've just crumbled apart. And you, know, you can see by the way that the rocks have fallen and the walls have fallen that it was earthquakes that got them. So yes, certainly they had to deal with earthquakes like we did. Maybe, this, uh, maybe an earthquake happened to us, this boat was at sea and a wave came and sank it. That's quite a nice theory. Now, we've got copper and tin in this ship, which we've got 10 tons of copper, one ton of tin, and that is the perfect recipe for bronze. So these are Bronze Age people. To make bronze, you need to get nine parts of copper and one part tin and mix them together under extreme heat, and you get bronze. So obviously, they're, they're taking the raw materials to make bronze around, you know, probably off to someone's furnace or kiln or something to, to start making some big, big, big amounts of bronze. But it wasn't just that they found on the ship. That's the boring stuff. Um, they would have found, oh, they did find about 150 jars. Um, in the jars, they found things like resin and olives, glass beads. They also found a whole load of wooden logs, you know, just maybe they were taken for carving or something like that. Um, elephant tusks, hippopotamus teeth, tortoise shells, oil lamps, pottery, amber, drinking cups, weapons, food, including nuts, olives and spices, a trumpet. Hmm, a trumpet. What are they doing with that? I don't know. Maybe you need a trumpet when you've got a bag full of hippopotamus teeth. Um, wooden tablets for writing on, a bit like a, a modern iPad, you know, uh, but not electronic, so that kind of shape, but made of wood with a frame. You'd put some wax in it, and then you could scribble onto the wax or some soft clay. Um, and that's the stuff they found in the ship. So lots of stuff. Um, what would they have used the tortoise shell for? Maybe art, or maybe, you know, hairbrushes, or... Uh, well, we can think of loads of things, I suppose. I mean, I honestly don't know what they do with hippopotamus teeth. I imagine carving them because a hippopotamus tooth is very big. Um, elephant tusks would have been used for all kinds of artistic uh, things. So, yeah. Uh, there we go. Yeah, good questions. So, um, ooh, 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 my chat's going funny. Um, ooh, no gold, no rock. I, have, I don't think they found any gold there glass beads but not gold um, and it doesn't seem that there was any money there that we know of so you know, it seems that they probably are trading goods so maybe you go down to maybe the ship was on its way back from Egypt towards Mycenae I mean we don't really know which direction it was going um, I like to think it was coming from Africa because of all the elephants and hippopotamus stuff you know so maybe they'd gone down to to Egypt uh, they'd swapped her stuff for that and then they were going to bring it back to Mycenae, swap it again for whatever the Mycenaeans are making, things like uh, you know, gold objects because they did have access to gold but not on this ship um, as we'll see in a minute and then maybe they, they 
turn around, go back to Egypt, swap it all again for other stuff. And we can imagine that this trade is going on constantly um, over many, many years, making everyone rich is the idea. Now, then, um, talking about gold, let's have a look at some of the gold and stuff that we find in Mycenae. Now, not all of this is found in the exact city of Mycenae. Um, these are from different Mycenaean cities. Um, but we'll start with the most famous one, the Death Mask of Agamemnon. Now, this is a golden death mask that was found on a dead body um, in a tomb. In fact, I think all of these objects were found in tombs um, attached to or next to dead bodies. So the person who found this, more on him in a bit, um, called Heinrich Schliemann, um, he declared that this was the death mask of the of the great famous king Agamemnon. Um, now Agamemnon was the king who started the Trojan War. Uh, if you remember last Friday when we talked about Aeneas, he was traveling, he was leaving the burning city of Troy. It was King Agamemnon that burnt his city down. Um, and the, the, the sort of story is that he then goes back to Greece and of course eventually he dies and he's buried in his tomb in Mycenae. Um, and he is given this death mask over his face uh, so that people know what he looked like in future years. Um, but it's made out of very thin be beaten gold. Um, most of the details have been put in by taking a pin or a nail, sorry, and then hammering it from the other side to make all these bumps and uh, raised and lowered areas. You know? Agamemnon. Let me see if I can spell that for you. Uh, da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da. See, where's my pen? Aga, mem, non. There we are. Aga, mem, non. Um, oh, I should have used the sparkly pen. Sorry, Grace. Next time, let me change it to sparkly pen now so that I don't forget. Um, so, uh, yeah, King Agamemnon. This is, in reality, it's probably not him. Yeah, it's probably just some mask that was found, but it's nice to link it to the ancients, I suppose. Uh, we don't know, of course, if King Agamemnon really existed, but it does link us to the stories of you know, the sack of Troy and Aeneas, because that would have been during the Mycenaean times. The person who wrote these stories, um, called Homer, he is writing about ancient history to him, so he's making a lot of it up, but also using a lot that would have been remembered, so it's really hard to tell what is real and what is not. The city of Troy was discovered, or at least a city that we now call Troy was discovered. Um, and a lot of people think that that was the place where the war happened, but we just don't know. Um, now, this over here uh, is another thing. This is called the Lion Hunt Dagger. Um, because it is a dagger, so a short sword, if you like, or a large knife, don't know how you look at it, really. Um, and this again was found with a dead body, probably a king of some kind. Um, but the detail in it is uh, been added in gold. And we can see that this is a picture of a hunting party. So we've got a group of human hunters here. Now, the Mycenaeans, they seem to have had these famous figure of eight shaped shields, um, big at the bottom, narrow at the top, but really, really huge to try and fend off lions with. Um, we can see here, probably the king or the dead person is involved, but we've got two lions running away. We've got one who's fighting. We've got one guy who's been mauled by the lion. Poor man. He's now on the floor with a lion pouncing on him. But all of his mates are there with their spears. This guy's got a bow and arrow. They're killing the lions. And this tells us quite a lot. It tells us that the Mycenaeans, they would go out hunting in groups. We know that hunting must have been important or you wouldn't have made a dagger showing a picture of it and then given that dagger to a king. Um, we can also tell that hunting lions is dangerous. Just ask poor Jeff here. Um, and we can also tell, of course, that there used to be lions in Greece. Not anymore, but there used to be. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, there's a lot of hunting going on. Uh, Grace, I don't know what it is. I'm sorry. Um, but yes, here we are. Uh, there we go. Now, this is what we just saw. Oh, I'm bringing the word dagger with me. I don't want that, do I? Go away, dagger word. Let's go over there. Um, this is called a pyxis, and this is what we saw the women carrying or something like this. These were, we reckon, probably either for holding cosmetics, so makeup, or maybe jewelry boxes. Um, but they're wooden boxes 
that have been covered inlaid with uh, gold. So we've got these golden panels all around it. It's six sided, it's a hexagonal box. Um, and you can see that whoever's made this has put loads of details. We've got deer and lions, and this looks like a horse and loads of different flowers and uh, beautiful things. Um, they're not massive, Jeff. Uh, Jeff asks how big these things are. You know, probably the size of maybe a chocolate box or, or something like that. Um, oh, I'll write the word here. Uh, let me write the word pixis or pyxis. I'm never sure how to pronounce half this stuff, as you can imagine. Um, but here we are. This is how you spell it. There we are. A pixis. So uh, a bit like the pixies. Yes, so very close. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so the Pyxis is this box where probably cosmetics, makeup, jewellery maybe, we're not quite sure. Um, but it seems to be, especially if we link it to those pictures that we saw earlier, seems to be that women would have used these to hold something important in them. Yeah, uh, We've got no evidence of what was in them. We've only got the boxes left, unfortunately. We then have this quite mysterious object. This is a ring. We know what it is. But no one knows what it means or what's going on. It seems like there's a a procession of dog-headed, pinecone-bodied monsters who are bringing jugs of wine to some kind of royalty, or possibly a god. Um, again, this is a gold ring. It's been made by using a nail and poking in all these little dots and holes to make the detail. It's, it's quite a small thing. It's not, it's not a big object, this. We just don't know what it means, you know. Are these demons? Are they gods? Are they monsters? Are they people in costume? Um, is this guy a king or a leader? He seems to be wearing some kind of lion pelt. Seems to have his feet either on a cushion or maybe in some kind of saucepan. Uh, he does have a very big cup and it does look like these guys are bringing him something to drink. But that's a lot of drink, so it's hard to tell. Um, now, Albert Einstein is asking what gods did they worship? And... We can see some references in some of their writing, but it's very vague. Um, it seems that they would have had um, what the Greeks would have later called Zeus, Poseidon, Hades, you know, the main gods. But it seems that for every male god they had, they had a female equivalent. So they would have had a male Zeus and a female Zeus. And although not with those names, um, a male sea god and a female sea god. But it's, it's very vague. It's, it's hard for me to say that for sure. Um, there's also a question over whether these people um, used human sacrifice. Some of their writing seems to suggest they might have done, but it's not enough. It's, it's not enough data to go on to actually work out if they were or not. It's all a bit vague. As you see, we'll look at their language in a, sec in a second. It's difficult to actually unpick exactly what they mean in their writing. Um, and we only have a very small amount of writing left. But yeah, so it could be that they had gods that were very similar to the Greek gods and then they sort of morphed into the Greek gods. Um, it may be that they were doing something far more sinister and barbaric, you know, sacrificing humans to the gods of the sky, but we just don't know. Yeah. Um, oh, that's a good question, Eliza. How did they end? We'll come to that in a, in a minute. Yes, that's a good question. Let me show you the writing first, though. Here we are. So this is a language called Linear B, and you'll notice it's kind of similar to Egyptian hieroglyphs or something. And there were two different kinds of symbol that they would use. And I've just shown one type here. Um, some of them were just icons to represent specific words. So man, woman, deer, horse, mare, stallion, etc. cetera. Yeah. Um, so if you wanted to say, you know, where is my deer? You would just draw a picture of a deer with like their equivalent of a question mark or something next to it, something like that. Um, but you can see from this list that there's kind of you know, loads of different words that you can say. Now, they also had um, uh, other kinds of letters that represented sounds that you could put together. So they've got like a ch sound and a z sound. So you could write in a mixture of these two word, kinds of words. So you might say ch its and then draw a picture of a horn, you know to say a word. Um, we don't know what their language, how they spoke it. We don't know what the sounds would have been. You know, we know that this picture meant a horse, but they wouldn't have said the word horse because that's an English word. They would have said, you know, whatever they said, we just don't know. Um, so we've worked out a few of these words. It took people a long time. It wasn't until the 1920s that it was worked out how this language works. And in fact, there's an older script called Linear A, which still has to yet to be deciphered, which the Minoans were using. So there is older examples of writing. It's just nobody knows what it means. 
it's too complicated it's too weird um the people who worked out how this worked um there were uh, linguists from uh, america and britain they worked on this together and they managed to work out what this meant by looking at similarities between these letters here's some ancient script um and comparing it to, to ancient Greek letters. And they noticed that there were some similarities and they could use those similarities to then work out what everything else meant. Uh, but it was quite a you know, academic achievement for sure. And um, this, this specific bit, the, the reason that we don't know much about these guys is that maybe they did write down huge stories and like details of history. The only bits of writing we have are a bit vague and this is a receipt. This was found in a merchant's house, or what we think was a merchant's house, and it basically says, it's, it's a list of goods, like we have three cauldrons, one with four legs, one with three legs, we have one barrel of grain, you know, it's just all this stuff, it's just a list of things. Um, we're really lucky that we have even this, because we reckon that what they would do, the merchants back then, they would just use wet clay, wet, squidgy, squashy clay, blah, 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 and when a ship came in like the shipwreck we saw they might get everything off the ship and they might just write a list of the things on the ship you know i've got i've got the hippo teeth tick i've got the elephant tusks i've got the trumpet good we needed that um and you write all that on the clay and you'd probably keep that for a few days as you needed it but then of course you sell all the goods and it all goes away and you don't need to keep your receipts back then so what you do is you squash up the clay again and you just use it to write again, yeah? So you'd squash and write and squash and write. And so all of this stuff was lost. Um, unluckily for the merchant, but very luckily for us, this merchant's house burnt down. It was in a great big fire. And so his receipts that he was working on, his squishy receipts, they ended up getting cooked. And as you know, if you cook wet clay, it turns into solid hard clay. So, you know, his house burnt down all the walls tumbled in and it was all lost to history until someone came along, dug it up and said, Oh, look, we found this piece of writing, which it took, you know, 70 years or so to translate. But when they did, they realized, Oh, we have a receipt. Oh, must've been in some ways a disappointing day for everyone. Um, but there you go. Um, <laughs> now, um, I own I'm afraid I cannot see you because I can only see me when I do these. All I can do is see what you're writing. There you go. I'm sorry. Um, uh, Jeff is saying there's a human head in the middle of the clay. Um, oh yeah, like over here we've got like a, that looks like a, a head of some kind, doesn't it? Yes, not sure what symbol that means. Uh, I cannot read linear B, unfortunately. So, um, so a couple of questions we've had here. How did this society end? Um, but before we have a look at that, let's have a look at the man who discovered the society, who brought it back to life, if you like. Um, Hmm. Well spotted, Grace. Hmm. It does indeed. Um, now this man here is Heinrich Schliemann, and he is both one of the best and one of the worst archaeologists in history. Um, he is one of the best because he discovered most of these Mycenaean ruins and started to excavate them, which means pull things out the ground. So it's thanks to him that we have these objects, or mainly him, not just him, but mainly him. He found the places, he started digging. Um, you can tell by his photograph here that he must have been, um, he was living in the Victorian times. Um, he's a German gentleman. Uh, I'll write his name up here. Uh, Heinrich Schliemann. Yeah. There we go. Um, now his wife, Sophia, we can see here as well, Sophia Schliemann. Um, and together they would travel around what, you know, ancient Greece, uh, well, it was modern Greece then, but they would travel around the sites of ancient Greece, digging and finding things and pulling them out of the ground. Um, it was Schliemann that worked out where Troy was or where we think Troy was um, by reading old documents, translating things, looking around, digging in the ground and finally finding the city of Troy, um, as well as our other Mycenaean cities. So in that sense, he is an, an amazing guy. Uh, without him, we, well, I wouldn't be able to show you all the stuff I've shown you today, that's for sure. Um, but since he was doing this in the Victorian times, this is a time before proper archaeology is done in the way that it is now. That didn't really get developed until the 1920s and 30s. Um, the archaeology of the Victorian times was more, we go to a place, we dig, 
and we see what we find. Nowadays, archaeology is very slow and very careful. Everything is moved inches away. You, you very carefully take the soil off of each object so you don't break anything. Heinrich's in there with a pickaxe. He's just like, well, hey, let's go. Uh, just chopping up the ground, pulling things out. Um, oh, Eliza asked how many Mycenaean cities were there? Quite a lot. I mean, the major ones were probably looking at five or six. Um, and it's difficult to tell which ones were exactly part of the Mycenaeans. You know, they might not have been friendly um, with each other. We call them the Mycenaeans because they all seem to have a similar culture to Mycenae. But for all we know, they were at war with each other the whole time and, you know, throwing stuff at each other. So, and whether they called themselves the Mycenaeans is you know, another quite, we just don't know. Um, but if, if we look at similar cities around the, around the area, there's probably you know, six, seven, eight big ones. Uh, there may be more under the ground, just waiting to be found, of course, uh, but lots of little ones. Ah, Albert Einstein says he watches, or she watches, I don't know, it's hard to tell with a way like Albert Einstein. Uh, they watch uh, Time Team. And of course, if you do watch that program, Time Team, you'll see that they, they'll take like three days, and they're doing it quick, but they'll take three days to dig a hole in a field somewhere and poke about a piece of bone. Heinrich, he ain't got time for that. He's like, no, I'm going to dig right now. I'm going to find all the lovely things. Wow. And he just goes for it. Um, how old was he when he died? I have no idea. He was a fairly old man. He must have been in his 60s or 70s at least. There are photographs of him looking older than this. Um, so unfortunately, when he was digging down, especially in places like Troy, um, cities they're, they're kind of built in levels because you get like the ancient stuff and then they build a new city on top of that and then that goes away and they build a city on top of that to get to the really early stuff Heinrich just kind of smashed through all the layers above so he has damaged a lot of the cities um which you know in some ways is bad but you know he didn't really know much better back then we just hadn't worked out how to do it properly I guess um he was a bit naughty though as we can see on this picture here Today, if you were going to go and find ancient treasure in a wonderful city, one of the things you would not do is sneak some of that treasure away without telling anyone. Give it to your wife, dress her up in it and take photos because this is Heinrich's wife and she is wearing grave goods from the tombs of Mycenae. Um, you know, this is pure gold she's wearing here. Um, and yeah, today that would find its way into a museum. Not for Heinrich. He's like, no, nah, nah, take the photo. You look beautiful, Sophia. How wonderful. Hmm. Um, so he's, he's maybe not being as careful as we would do today. Um, it is rumored that he snuck more stuff out that we just don't know about. Um, he also misidentified some stuff. He found something called a write-on, which is a, a drinking vessel that you pour water through. Let me see if I can find your picture of one of those, actually. Um, and he found this thing. And he wasn't quite sure well, what it was. Um, so he decided that it was definitely a flower pot. Um, it wasn't a flower pot. We now know that it's for pouring wine through, but you know, he had a guess, I suppose. Um, here's a write on here. This one's from Mycenae. Um, and the idea was you put, would, you would have your uh, wine, big jug of wine, and then you would hold this right on over someone's glass or cup and you would pour the wine into the head and it would pour out through the lion's mouth into the cup in just this fancy display of i don't know wine whatever um so he wasn't always sure what he was finding um there are other rumors that some of the stuff he planted himself he made himself and put in the ruins to pretend it was ancient but that's been not proven uh, i think uh, you know he's maybe a bit dodgy maybe a bit um uh, maybe a bit careless at times, but I don't think he, I don't think he made stuff up very much as far as I know. Yeah. Um, ah, there you are. Rock's telling us that he lived for 68 years from 1822 to 1890. Thank you very much, Rock. There you are. <laughs> Good man. Um, I, I suppose, Eliza, it could pour two glasses at a time. Yes. Maybe you could do very clever things with right ons. Yes. How tall was Heinrich Schliemann? I don't know how tall he was. I wish now that I'd, I'd read a biography of Heinrich Schliemann before doing this lesson. And then I would know all the Schliemann facts, but I don't. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so the question that uh, someone asked, uh, Eliza asked earlier, how did all this end? What happened to it? Well, we can tell from different cities that different things happened. Um, at the end of the Mycenaean era, in about, well, between about 1100, oh, sorry, about 1200 and 1150, um, the whole of the ancient world pretty much got destroyed. Um, 
ancient Egypt took a blow that it never really recovered from, that, you know, the heights of its Egyptian civilization would never be met, matched again. Uh, the Assyrians were kicked backwards, um, that they stabilized for about 100 years before falling to ruin. The Hittites were completely destroyed, those people in Turkey, and the Mycenaeans were completely destroyed too. And it's a mystery as to why. Maybe a disease, maybe um, crop failure and famine, maybe floods, um, maybe just massive war broke out. There's definitely a lot of evidence of uh, flame damage in a lot of the ruined cities. Earthquakes could be an answer as well. Um, what we do know is that more than likely it was caused by climate change because a homosive um, volcano called Hecla III erupted in Iceland which is a long way away from Mycenae. The people of Mycenae didn't know that Iceland existed. But this volcano was so powerful that it would have changed the, the climate for a few years. So maybe that volcano erupted, chucking loads of ash into the sky. The earth cooled down a bit. Uh, um, and that led to famine. You know, the lack of you know, the plants wouldn't grow. Uh, maybe the rains didn't stop or maybe the rains didn't come. We just don't know. And one way or another, the people ended up dead. Um, and yeah, we call this the Bronze Age collapse, and, it, and it's a mystery to everyone. You know, uh, every historian you talk about, talk to about the Bronze Age collapse, will have their own particular theory, from you know invading armies to migration patterns to just this volcano just ruining everything. Truth is, we don't know in specifics what it was. That, that your guess is as good as mine on this one. What we do know, though, is the Mycenaeans they got hit by whatever this was during this 50 year period. They went from being very powerful to all being gone. Um, the Egyptians were shaken, the Assyrians were nearly destroyed and the Hittites went too. Um, and yeah, there you go. That was the end of that. Um, but not forever because of course about uh, three, 400 years later maybe, Homer starts writing down the tales of the Mycenaeans, King Agamemnon, etc., And then that ends up feeding into the Greek culture and then the Roman culture. So there's definitely a straight line between the Mycenaeans into Greece and then into Rome and then to today. So there you are. They may be ancient, but they're still kind of important. Hmm. Um, ah, yes, that's right, Mega Gengar. Before the Bronze Age was the Stone Age. And after this, after the Bronze Age ended, it was the Iron Age. So the ancient Greeks and Romans would have been able to work with iron, which is something that the Hittites first developed, um, which is another theory for how the Bronze Age ended. Maybe some guys just got hold of a lot of iron and just destroyed everyone else with it. We just don't know. Um, are we in the diamond age? Uh, no, I suppose now people generally call this the technological age. Um, you know, maybe the information age, something like that. Uh, I mean, the idea of Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age doesn't really work because they're not really times. If we went to America at this time, everyone's still using stone. And they use stone up until, the well, nearly the... Uh, 16th century until Columbus comes along because no one in America develops bronze or iron. So there you go. Uh, doesn't mean they're any more backwards. It just means they have a different technology. It doesn't mean that time is moving differently for them than it is for us. So, you know, Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age is a bit of a, a bit of a shoddy tool, if you ask me. Um, but anyway, we will end it there today. That's a bit of a snapshot of Mycenae and Mycenaean culture. Uh, come back on Friday, though, and we will do a story of a brave hero leaving Troy, trying to get his way back to, well, Mycenae, a king of one of these kingdoms, um, Odysseus himself. Thank you very much, guys. Have a wonderful day, and I'll see you soon.